Hi, everybody. Maybe we're finally here. Let's hope. This was quite exciting. We have all this fabulous new equipment, but guess what? Now we're using Deb's phone. I hope you're enjoying your cups of tea. I'm trying to stay calm. I'm on my second cup of tea, so this could be quite a thing. Welcome. I'm hoping that with the Calgary Horticultural Society and our Facebook program that this will get better. Anyway, cheers. Here's to a really good show. Let's hope. I know that you have questions. I'm hoping that you're willing to ask me some questions. I was going to kick it off a bit by I, the gardening by the moon has reared its head. So I was going to talk a little bit about the next full moon, which occurs on April the 7th. Now, April the 7th is a full moon, and it's called the full pink moon in honor of all of the creeping moss flocks that flowers all over the northern part of the hemisphere. And this is probably one of our favorite times of year. And when we look at the moon, everybody goes, oh, it's such a bunch of whatever. But my grandpa and even my mom believed in using the moon to judge when they planted and where the time frames were coming from and how they were setting them up. Now, are we really and truly onto something? Some people believe that the moon has magical qualities. I'm probably one of them. However, there's also scientific proof that the moon does, as we all know, the moon and etc. gravity controls tidal tides. So they, these, the people that subscribe to this belief believe that it pulls the soil, it affects how the soil, it affects how things root. In fact, in the waning of the full moon is, especially in April, May, and June, is when you should be planting root crops because it draws the moisture down into the soil. So, and as the new moon comes in, it draws moisture out of the soil, so you're planting uh, leaf crops like lettuces, etc. I, I guess I subscribe to that because my grandfather always planted 20 feet of beets and he always looked for the full moon in April and he would count five to eight days after or six days afterwards and he would plant. And he always grew the best beets and the best carrots as far as I'm concerned. I, I guess what I'm saying here is that I do believe in it and I do believe that there has to be a reason why we follow it and so did our forefathers. So that's my trivia for t today. Now the next part I was going to talk about, and I'm hoping that you're gonna ask questions and, and join in, but the next part of this is pruning because we're coming to the end of a window where we can prune things. I'm looking at the fact that I have a few branches with me today, and this is kind of fun. I pulled these out of, <laughs> I pulled these out of my Christmas arrangement and they're willow and they came from up by Slave Lake and the funny thing is they're still green and alive and growing in there even they're frozen solid into the container but the reason that I know that they're growing is they're in the container they're growing pussy willows. <laughs> so I was just tickled to see that and that just gave me one more feeling that spring really is here. So why do we prune? We prune because we need to do things like cosmetically the tree or the shrub needs to look better. It's a good time to do it in February, March because we can go in and we can look at the bare structure of a branch. And, and usually what we're looking at is we're looking for disease, we're looking for open wounds, we're looking for the fact that the branch opens up like a vase of roses. So is that indeed what we're we're doing yes and when I also look at the smaller shrubs that I have and I'm looking to make sure that the crown doesn't get too crowded and then if the crown is too crowded I try to open them up because I like to see the passage of air through them I don't want them to become crowded in the branching and it makes a big difference to how they set up and I'm usually at this time of year looking at my pruning tools and I'm looking at how good they are and I'm always checking to see that the mechanisms are good and I clean them up a bit before I work. Because quite honestly, one of the things that I'm bad to do is I carry around a pair of pruners and I'll cut things here and there and I realize suddenly that the branches, the, the, uh, the, 
the blade is not sharp anymore or it's a little bit dirty. So I will carry around with me things like, I found the best thing was these old onion bags and you just clean them with that and that cleans all the goop off of them and keeps them clean. And then I'm checking to see how sharp they are. And I'll use a whetstone, which apparently I forgot this morning. That wasn't the only glitch, but that was one of them. And I'm, I'm looking at my branching. And you can do this on small trees. You can do it on shrubs. You can look at them and go, oh, I can just cut them off and I can clean them up. And you don't want to leave too much of a stub. And you always want to cut, especially when you're going to cut a main branch off you're always going to try and cut right in inward towards the branch because you don't want to have that branch crotch sitting there and gathering dirt and disease, etc. So you're cleaning them up. And I'll, I'll use my hand pruners for nothing larger than my thumb. And I'm not going to cut my thumb off as a demo today. Or you can get a small pair of loppers. I'm not wild about these unless there's lots of dead branching in them and I will use loppers I can control. If you've got anything that's too big, but if you look here, you could probably put my thumb in and cut it off. And I'm not, as I said earlier, I'm not gonna do that. But I do like a good clean cut and these have a ratchet so that they can work in slowly. But I usually mainly use these for broken branches and for dead branches. And that's when I will work with them. And then there are things like saws and uh, the pruning saws, the serrated edge, and you can get up and in them. But put something on your eyes to protect yourself and don't stand directly under the branch you're going to cut. Remember, safety first. We are vulnerable. We have to look at how much we can handle. And if it's a big job, hire a professional. Get someone in and check their credentials. Make sure that they have the certification and they'll talk to you properly. And if you've got a big tree to take down or anything big to take off the tree, get it cleaned up. Have we had any questions yet? <laughs> I have not seen somebody liked our post. So hopefully that means maybe you're, you're well, not. I can't see anything. You can't see anything? Gail can't see either. You can't so see on the any? feed, it's not coming through? No. The feed's not coming? Are we not getting... Francis is watching. Okay. Wave. Hi, Francis. <laughs> okay. How do we do that? I don't know. Interesting. We hey, see, we're, we're Francis. learning here. <laughs> yeah, Francis. This is, a, this is a learning curve. Thanks, Francis. <laughs> no. Francis, call me at the office. <laughs> We need to know how you're watching, Francis. Did you find it? It says hello. <laughs> oh, good. Why is nobody else able to see it? Well, I'm looking. Like... Francis This is called improvisation, video. folks. Oh, I see another comment on the... But I can't read them because the printing's too it small. It says, yeah, the content is not available oh. when I try to go there. But I am like, Francis... And somebody else, did Francis come back? It says you are live on the free. That's what she's saying. Oh, perfect. Well, well audience of at least one. Well, we've got a crew then. <laughs> Thanks, Francis. Thank you. So some of the things that I was thinking about planting and have been looking at in my basement and looking at where I'm at with what's in storage, I had to, I dug out a canna lily about three, four weeks ago, and it's up and growing, but it's too big to haul around. But I did find some cannas in a, my pop cooler, in my old pop cooler. And if Glenn would just bring me the pop, the... <laughs> I found these styrofoam pop, these styrofoam coolers at one of the stores and what I did this winter was I experimented and I put my canna lilies in their small pots and they are growing still. They are just coming like crazy. So I thought that they weren't alive. So today I hauled them out and I'm wrong. They're growing. In fact, they're so well rooted in here that I can hardly get them out. So they're rooted. And all I'm going to do is freshen up the soil and I'm gonna give them just a small bit of worm castings 
and put them in the sun and they're going to grow for me. So those are some of the things that you can. You can go to the store right now. The canna assortment is pretty, pretty interesting. And if you want them big, tall leaves, I mean, this is my bright cherry pink that I just love this guy. And he is quite a pretty one and he looked really nice on my back deck. So I have stored it in the winter in my unheated garage in that styrofoam container. The soil is moist and it held really well and the root system is fabulous down there and the tuber still feels wonderful. I don't want to pull it out because I don't want to rip my roots away. So it is one that I'm quite pleased and excited to see. And then I went over to the garden center and I found that the begonia bulbs were still around and I really like a trailing begonia. I think that they are quite gorgeous, the pendula. So I found this beautiful, big, look at this thing. He's just gorgeous and he's got a sprout already and he's got some nice hairy roots started. So I'm going to take some of the potting medium that was in the bag and add it to the pot I'm using. And I just have it sitting in this pot because I don't want the soil trickling all over the the table. So I've got the pot sitting in a fancier pot because it's going to go home and live on my dining room table with everything else that I'm trying to grow. And the trick is, is when you put a begonia bulb in, you just nest it in and you don't bury the top of it yet. You want it to, you want it to start and sprout and you don't want to get moisture and soil in there till you get several growth eyes and then it will start to grow and it will hang over. And I'm doing it in this six inch pot because my intention is to try to see if this will maintain in a six inch pot. I'm not sure it will. I may have to move it up to an eight inch, but they are pretty spectacular and just one bulb just makes such a great show. So that's one of the things that I've been doing while I've been staying at home. That and annoying my friends and chatting incessantly when I phone them. But so start looking at starting canna lilies and some of the summer flowering bulbs because they're out there. The begonias, they need to get started now so that they'll be showy and on time for the season. I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting antsy, but at the same time I'm going, no, we've got to get past Easter weekend. And even then I'm not sure where we're going to get to next, but I'm also looking at my seed collection and I have to lean down to my seeds under the table. Sorry, I'm disappearing for a minute. There we go. Thanks, Glenn. So I've been looking in my cupboards and I've been digging around trying to see where I'm going with my seeds. Oh, are there questions? Well, just letting you know that we do have Cheryl is seeing it and the session is working well. So oh, excellent. thank you. But looks like I'm going to have to read the questions, the questions. off. Okay. So this is Deb helping <laughs> as well. Deb and Glenn are sitting here, thank goodness, because with everything that we're trying to do, it's learning the technology as we go along. So I was challenged the other day by someone that I saw on Facebook talking about trying to grow lettuce seeds. And I know that I buy lettuce all the time. So the back part of my row will prove to you that I bought lettuce last fall, I guess. But I've already seeded some of that. And I will tell you that in my planter at home, outside, it's growing. I find it difficult to grow lettuce inside. I find lettuce likes it cool. They germinate fast when they're in cool temperature. When it's too warm for them or they're buried too deeply, they don't grow well. So what I usually do with lettuce seeds, and I particularly am always looking for leaf lettuce, and what I'm looking for is a good light potting mix, and I will take and I will do up just a test pot to see how my germination rate is because these seeds are from last year. So I think they're still pretty good. They've been in my, in my cold storage. I don't want to crowd this pot, but I'm just going to gently, I'm just going to gently tap my seed into my pot and they don't want to be buried deeply. 
the biggest mistake people make is burying them too deeply. So I've got a light dusting, just a little bit more soil on them, and then I will line them all up, the things that I'm gonna test, because I've got, well, I told you I was a bit of a lettuce collector, so I have all these lettuces. I already have chard planted in my yard, and outside in the cool, I planted it last fall because they germinate better in the cool. I've got spinach outside coming, and I like it because it, they're, when they're new and they're little and the weather's been cool, they taste so tasty. They're so tasty. New baby greens are my favorites. Now you're probably going to say, how does she know what year she bought her seeds in? Well, quite often, if you take a look at the labeling, it will have dates on the bottom part of the label. So you can see if we're getting kinds of dating and, and if they're old. And I'm a little leery. I, I bought some seeds today and I thought I was getting 2020. Well, apparently I, and I won't tell you, I didn't buy them at a garden shop. I just happened to spot them and I thought, oh, I'm going to pick some up in case I can't find mine in the basement. Well, I found mine, but I'm looking and apparently I did buy 2019 seed. So I'm a little but I don't think I'll have a problem because lettuce lasts a long time. And one of the things I mentioned earlier is that when we start certain seeds, like I think most of you have started seeds or are getting ready to start seeds. So I'm, I belong to a tomato cooperative. My friend Dave grows the tomatoes in our group. I don't grow them because Dave does such a spectacular job. And so I will let him go with those. But I have, over the years, just seems to collect seed because I like them. And I look at, for instance, I have Better Boy Hybrids, which are a nice sized tomato. And I have Subarctic Plenty. And I have Sweet 100, because Sweet 100 tomatoes are one of my favorite cherry tomatoes. They're prolific, and they're very, very sweet. And then the Rainbow Blend. If you've ever grown Rainbow, Rainbow Blend, it's an heirloom. And it is very interesting because it has stripy fruit and it's really quite tasty. It's a nice one to grow. And then my favorite heirloom or heritage tomato of all is black crim and they are without a doubt very tasty. So one of the things that I was going to say is because some of the comments that I'm seeing on Facebook are about the strength of their plants and they're growing in spindly. We're, we're seeing that and so when you first seed them when you're first seeding them and you get them up and you're growing, you put them into, you put your pot into a seed tray so that the water doesn't drain around and fall apart and, you know, go all over your table, which has happened to me. And you put your pots inside the tray and until they germinate, you keep the plastic lid on them. And the plastic lid keeps the humidity in and you're not watering them as much. However, once they start to germinate and they start to come up, you want to take the lid off so that you get air circulation around them and they're gonna look a little spindly and if you haven't got them in enough light, you're gonna find that you're gonna have, you will have to keep turning the pot so that as they germinate, they will grow and not just keep all going to the light. And my other big investment the last few years has been a small fan and it just gives a nice gentle breeze. You don't put it right up next to the tray where you're germinating and where you've got things growing. You wanna set it away so that the wind blows gently, but that creates stronger stems. It keeps them closer to the ground because the ground stays warm. And I really, really approve of doing something like this to get it going. However, now, like my, if you're not like myself, I'm very lucky. My kitchen faces south and west so there's always sun coming in and I'm always looking for light for things. And I have to admit, I have a six foot kitchen table, but it's now overly full. So I am looking for places to move things. My guest room, if anyone comes to stay with me, we will have to find a way to move the plants that are on the guest room bed because I have plants there and I've, the other begonias that I've started are 
everywhere in the guest room, so I'm, I'm fighting that battle, and I'm fighting the battle of, you know, where am I going to find lighting? So I'm going to use a grow light, and I'm going to try that, because the other thing is that my canna lily, the one in the giant pot, I am fighting the battle of the, of the uh, how much light can I give it, and it's going to be one of those things. I'm going to try and find it. And as the plants grow, be prepared for the fact that you're going to set the lights over top and you're gradually going to raise them as the plants grow up. You don't want to put, the, want to put them too close because the plants will burn or scorch. And here again, you may have to redirect the fan a bit to get the air circulation. And I sometimes, with grow lights, as I have done over the years, I like to change the location of my pot, my plantings in my grow lights and just see how they work from there. So what we are doing here is we're trying to create a grow environment. And that's what I'm trying to do all the time. I'm always looking for places to put more plants. I, I Before I came today, I was looking for how things were doing in my kitchen because I'm always rearranging trying to find room and plus it's geranium cutting time how many of you have geraniums sitting at home and you've taken a couple of sets of cuttings this resided in my basement till about five or six weeks ago and I thought that I had truly forgotten to water it and it wasn't going to do well but this is literally one cutting and it look at it's even got new growth in the center so it's bushing in just beautifully and I'm looking at it and I kept this one because I love the color it's a rosy rosy hot pink and it just looks spectacular in my tall black planter next to my uh, formium which is a New Zealand grass so I really enjoyed it last year so I kept a piece of it which you can do or you can keep a whole pot of it and do that but I will now, because I've got a couple of blank spots and I want to get a couple of more cuttings from it, I will take, I have a little sharp knife and I will take, and instead of using scissors, I reach in and I will take a cutting off of that and I will cut to a leaf nodule. And I, since it's already lost a few of the leaves along here, I will... I'm hunting for a pot, a green pot one. A green pot and some soil in it, please. And I will take a cutting off of it. Thank you, I thought I'd done that. <laughs> and I will take it off and then I'll just give it a nice little bit of a clean cut with a knife so it's not crushing. And then I use stem root number two. And I don't want to contaminate my stem roots. So I will quite often, I don't want to waste the rooting hormone. So I will take and I'll shake it into the little bit and I just get a dusting of it. And I will use a fine tooth, toothbrush. No, this is a little paintbrush. And I will cover the surface. I will try to get it on this as much as possible. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take and just dust just dust the bottom of the cutting. You don't want to dust the whole stem. You want to dust the cutting. So I will take, I will take, and I'll use a spoon, a spoon or a pencil, a pencil will do, and I will use it as a dibber. And I'm making it a hole so that I'm not going to break it, and I'm going to stick it in. I will then take a label and the label serves two purposes. I will have written the date I took the cutting. I will also then be able to support it a little bit. And I gently tap the pot so that the stem becomes firmly lodged into the pot. So I'm all set to go. And I have pre-watered the soil. So I am looking at that and I'm thinking, well, that's good. So now today, I have taken a cutting, so that's one more thing off my job list. And I have made a second geranium. So I'm gonna have, by the time I'm done, I'm hoping to have two or three really pretty 
charmingly lovely doubly pink uh, geraniums. So they're going to look great. Now, I broke a leaf off. Believe it or not, this leaf has a hard end. So here again, I'm just going to dust the end of it. And I'm going to go back to the pot that I just put over my shoulder. And I'm going to stick the pencil in. And I'm going to just put it in. And I'm going to probe it right down. And it too will root. We can check back on this when I'm back in April. And hopefully the there won't be any damage to the leaf. And it will have rooted just fine. And I will have several geraniums. But remember, moisten your soil ahead of time. And then water it fairly deeply in about three weeks. So it should be going from I that. Just, I just found it. Very good. There's traffic in front of me. I'm having trouble keeping track, you guys. So has anybody asked any questions? Have we got questions? We're checking. We're checking? Okay. No question. Oh. We have a comment, though, from Cheryl saying, I right. love the Sweet 100 Tomatoes as well. It's a good one for Calgary. It is. I, I really enjoy Sweet 100, and I love that yellow one, the little yellow cherry tomato. Oh, it's so good. The name is eluding me at the moment. Lemon Boy. Lemon Boy's the bigger guy. Now, I get a lot of questions about succulents. So today I was out, well last night actually, I was in the garage going to do my recycling and do some stuff in my green bin. And about, about two weeks ago I got mad at my succulents because the ones I'd brought in from outside, I'd done a very, very thorough job of cleaning them and I thought I had eradicated the insect problem. Now this might be too fine to see but when I first looked at it, I had mealybug. And the mealybug was running all along right where the leaves joined the stems. And I went, now how's anyone supposed to see that? So I immediately got angry and I put it outside and I didn't put it in the, the green bin right away. I just sort of set it on the edge of the bin, meaning to throw it in. And yesterday was my pickup, or well, today this morning was pickup day but last night I was out in the garage throwing things in to make sure the green bin would go out well I look over at my succulent and I'm looking and I'm going well what happened to the mealybug well who knew they survived the cold and now they're trying to find warm homes so they've migrated up into the fleshier part of the leaf where by the way the plant itself in my unheated garage is still trying to survive, even though it lost a little bit and I quit watering it. So now the mealybug is still alive and it's still moving around. Our temperatures have been down to minus 19 in the last three weeks. My garage, the lowest temperature it hit last week was minus five. I have a thermometer in there. And these scourge of my life, these mealybugs, are still alive in that cold weather. So it tells me that we get, I guess we have to really watch how they survive. And when I, I'm going to do this now, I didn't want to cut it off before, but I have in the past cut the tops just and kept them. But if you'll notice, I, I wish the camera was better, but you can see that the mealybug, oh, and he's moved since I've been handling him. He's now all curled up and gone to the underside of the leaf. These are devil's children. I don't like them, but they're white and they're fuzzy and they're sticky. And this one actually, oh, I wish we could get a close up of that. He's actually got, he's moving down back into the crux of the branch. Interesting to me. So um, anyway, David, we should get a picture because he's moving. Look, see, he's right there. And then there's another one. Anyway, so this pot, pot and all, is is going in the my recycle and into my green bin because I really don't want to fight this one. But the other thing that I've been doing is in the fall when I've put plants away, I've had cra crashes and I've had things happen and things break. So when my succulents break off, I save pieces and I always keep a pot in my kitchen 
so that I can see what will root and what won't root. And I have, I have a beautiful burrow's tail in my, in my kitchen that I is now probably easily four feet long. But every once in a while, the dog crashes into it, so I end up with pieces. So this was a piece that I had last fall, and I just laid it on the soil, and it has formed a root ball. I didn't water it. I left it dry, and that's what you do. You don't, with succulents, you don't throw away the parts because I don't know if you can see this, but there's a leaf sticking out here. Well, from the leaf that I tucked in there in the dry soil, there's a new baby growing. Deb, can we show them the the new baby and the, the succulent yes. leaf? Here we go. And it's just rooting like a mad thing, and I'm going, oh, that's just fabulous. But the biggest accident I had last fall was I picked up a pot and it had, it had become a little bit elderly and it was falling apart. So it disintegrated on me as I brought it out. And this is one of my favorite Duranthus. And, and I really like these guys there. They're a succulent and they are, they have the ruffly foliage. If you can see, see the big ruffled foliage? Well, it had branched out in this pot and it had broken off. And I thought, well, I'm just going to lay it in this pot. So I took two chopsticks and I had pushed them in to keep it in place. And I left the stem and all on the soil. So what I'm hoping you can see is the fact that the stem down at the base has formed a whole new root ball and is rooting. And you can see where it's hardening off. And I'm just going to, when I clean up the soil, when I get it home, I'm just going to replant it. Show them this now. It has, the root has formed right off the dried callus broken stem. And it has all those calluses up the stem and I'm going to put it in and try to straighten it up using my chopsticks. Chopsticks are very valuable. You don't want to throw them away because they keep things straight. So that is another plant that I'm really keen about. And then I've done, I've had a few others break off and I just keep the pieces. And I mean, doesn't everybody use their soup spoon to repot and to dig things out of pots? That's what I do. And this one, this one broke about, oh, a month and a half ago. And I just stuck it in the dry soil. And I do, I use things like my chopstick and dig it in so that I'm not gonna disturb it. And then it just roots and they root beautifully. No rooting hormone, very little disturbance of them and they just keep on growing. And my spoon, I took this piece off of another one and it has is only been in this pot now for about four weeks and it's already got a nice strong root in it. And whenever a leaf breaks off, I noticed that it's already got a bit of a callus, so I don't throw them away. I keep gathering them and putting them back in. So it's just a question of getting a good, well-drained soil, and you don't water them very often. I don't water this. I, I literally leave this science experiment sitting on a lower shelf in my plant collection, and I just keep replanting and playing with the cuttings until I've got several going on. And they make giveaway plants. They're great pass-along plants. You can say to somebody, do you need a succulent? Would you like a piece of my burrow's tail? I've always got something to pass along. And it just brings along, you know, the spirit of our gardens because half of our gardens, or not half of them, but a good percentage of the ornamental part of our garden can be pass-along plants. And we can start giving them away to each other and it's just fun to do. Does anybody else collect plants and do things like that? Do you take cuttings off of your existing plants and grow them? I mean, when I was pruning this willow and I discovered that it had pussy willows and it was still green and viable, I think what I'm going to do is take some cuttings from it. I'm going to take some pieces and grow it because this is a lovely little red twigged willow from up in the North Country and it's doing very well. It survived the winter in my winter arrangement. So it's quite nice and I'm gonna take some cuttings from it. 
it's just one of those ongoing as I go along with things that I try to do. I'm always trying to get a plant to grow something different or produce something better or come along. <laughs> a little bit of a pause there while I suddenly went, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find that. Somebody put in a nice comment, so I'm going to try to find it. Okay, so we're getting some comments. So we finally have people watching. We have a few more people watching, so this is That's great. That's good. That's good. Uh, Sharon has, thanks for the gardening fix. Good to hear you, Kath. Oh, nice. And I brought I brought in some succulents, a few are leggy, so I cut them now. Yes. Should I cut them now, plant them up so they're ready to go outdoors in June? So Absolutely. Ready. Now you want to start doing this and start taking cuttings. And I'm going to, I've got a couple of euphorbias that are needing some serious rescu rescuing. So I'm going to take them apart this week and repot them. I would have brought my one in, but it is so big that I am afraid for it. <laughs> it's going to fall apart. But don't be afraid to just take leaves and put them on the pot and watch them. If you don't overwater them, they grow beautifully. And they are really interesting to watch produce and grow. So, yes, this is a great time to do that. A lot of our house plants right now, they're building root systems before they're going to take off again for the, for the summer and spring and summer months. And a lot of our house plants, yes, some of them want to be repotted at this point, but don't forget that where they grow naturally, most of them are tropical or subtropical species, and they fight to grow in places and they like crowded root spaces and they do really well in crowded root spaces. But the biggest trick of all with all of this is to make sure that you have a good potting mix and that you're not too liberal with the water. Don't overwater. I find that the biggest thing I see with plant material and even seedlings is that some people overwater them or they use a watering can with a hard spout and they just pour directly on things and they get erosion and then the roots are exposed. So you want to be watering gently and if you don't handle your um, watering can gently with things and you're getting a lot of erosion, it might be a good idea to get a spray bottle and spray your root systems so that they get nice and moist without getting overly wet. I'm, I'm still looking at things that I grow in my garden and I go, well, I'm working mainly on vegetables these days. And I, when I look at my vegetable garden, I've got my tomatoes lined up. I've got that done. I think that my cooperative is, is on the game now. So I think we're going to see a great year for tomatoes. Let's hope. I mean, last year was a little rainy. And I, I didn't do well until later in the season. And then I had so many tomatoes that I wasn't sure what I was going to do with them all. So at this juncture in time, I'm, I'm looking at my tomato crop and I've handled that. How many of you are going to grow squash this year? I think squash is one of those crops that you can keep going with it because you get a good harvest off of it in the fall. And you can keep them in a cool space and they do just fine. And, I actually have a butternut squash on my counter that's been there now for four months and I made soup out of the first one that I took uh, from my friend Kathy and Dave and they gave me one from their garden and it was fabulous. It was so tasty. I made squash soup and I just enjoyed it so much. It makes such a big difference when it's fresh like that. But I've got one more and I'm going to make some more soup. So it is an entertaining way to go and I have over the years grown patty pans. Have you grown patty pan squash? They're edible. The skin is edible. I enjoy them quite a bit. I have from Renee's Seed, I have the summer patty pan and there are many colors. There's actually in this package there's yellows and greens and a white one and I like them with the scalloped edge and they're really fun to watch. The kids love it because when they grow they, they're like zucchinis. They go, don't grow giant, but they'll re up the, you'll have these giant leaves over top. And then you'll think, oh, I've eaten them all. They're all gone. And then you just pull back the leaves and heck, there's 10 more sitting there and you've got a whole feast going right there. But they are one of my favorite summer squash. When you grow squash from seed, one of the things that you should watch 
And what I like to do is I take a, an emery board and I go around the edges with the, with the emery board and I just file it. It's sort of like scarifying. When you read about scarifying your seeds, it's part and parcel of just roughing up the edges. Don't scarify the pointed tip. That's where they grow from. And don't bury them. Bury them the depth of the seed with just a small covering on top and they'll do really, really well. Another squash I discovered last year that I really enjoyed, and I didn't grow enough of it, and I will this coming year, is this mashed potato squash. And it's a white squash, and it mashes just like a potato. It was very tasty. But I only grew two plants, and because of the way the weather was, I struggled a little bit with it. And so I got, I think I got three or four, so I had mashed potato squash, and it was quite tasty. But here, here are the shapes of a squash seed with the pointed side up, Deb. There's, there's that, and I didn't bring my emery board, but you literally just take the seed, and it's very fine, and you just scarify. You just take a, a, an emery board, the light brown side, not the dark brown side, and you just gently rough those edges, and then you just put it in moist soil, and I usually will grow them in a four inch pot, two to a pot, to, to for survival reasons. If the, one takes and the other doesn't, but you can always dip them out, but they grow a much stronger root system when they're in a four inch pot, and they grow a lot deeper. And that is part of the squash thing, is that squash are, big growers on a lot of levels. The little patty pans aren't as big growers. They don't sprawl, if you will. They tend to stay in one area, but this mashed potato squash was huge. It took over the whole corner of my yard, so I kind of had to take it with a grain of salt. And last year, I was driving along Kensington Road one morning going somewhere, and I saw that these people had planted a squash on their front lawn and that was all that was growing there. And it was spectacular, it was so big. And I went back later in the fall and I bet you there were 15 squash on there. But I think squash are a great crop for keeping. And when you can look at what you can grow and how, what you can live on, it's how the crops that you grow produce enough to feed you. All summer you can grow lettuce and right into the fall, the same thing with spinach. But then there's the crops that you grow so that you can store them or pickle them or anything like that. And that brings me to beets. Have we tried yellow beets? I think yellow beets are some of the scrummiest thing on the planet, but then I'm kind of odd. I grew up eating beets. But I enjoy the beets, the yellow beets particularly, and I like them. They keep well. They're a root crop that stores in a cool room quite willingly, and they are great when you grill them. They just taste wonderful, so they have a great flavor. And now there's these great beets that are out that are stripes, chioga. That's another good one. I didn't get, I couldn't find my package of that. But how many vegetables can we all grow in our garden? How many vegetables will we grow that will give us a cash crop? I mean, or in my mind, a cash crop. How many are keepers? So that's where you look at what you can grow in your garden and what you can grow, say for instance, supplement your garden by starting out with some lettuces in pots and growing root crops in the ground or in your raised beds so that you have crops that you can harvest and keep going with. And I have my favorite carrots. Carrots are really tasty and I think there's nothing nicer than walking through the garden and picking my carrots. I like little finger. They're a little fine carrot. I, I look for them, I quite often will plant them, and I companion plant them with radish seeds. So those of you that know me and love me, I talk about radishes as one of my favorite things to do. But sometimes the carrots are a little slow, and they take a bit to get going, and then they suddenly appear. And I will quite often intersperse my radish seeds with them because the radishes come up quickly, and they loosen the ground, and they get the plant loosened up enough so then the carrots come out and then you're thinning them off and radish leaves radish are as a sprout are delicious so i'm always growing radishes i get into a seed rack and i sometimes will buy 10 or 12 packages because 
I plant them where I want things to germinate and they're slow to germinate, like my cucumber. And I will direct seed squash quite frequently and I will plant radishes with them just to keep the soil aerated. And then I'm not always poking around with my finger or taking a trowel and loosening the soil and then I loosen out the seeds and then they don't do well. So are we getting any questions at all? <laughs> there is a question. Oh my goodness, good. So what I wanted to know, or they wanted to know, is radishes in a balcony pot, like could you do them in a 10 inch pot or an eight inch pot, or is that not wide enough? Um, you can do them in a 10 inch pot. The eight inch pot, they get a little too crowded. And then you've got to remember about radishes that they, they are literally fast growing and fast producing. So you're always thinning them and eating them so that they keep producing. But you don't do a seeding, say for instance, if you start to run out of them, if you start seeding in late July into August, those are the hot days and radishes don't do well in hot, in heat, they get a little woody. So I like to do them, if I'm gonna do them in pots, I'm gonna do them in, I prefer a small narrow planter for them, like a window box and I'll grow them in a row in there, two or three rows thick and then I can keep picking some of the greens out as I thin them and leaving some to form the root system. All right, we've got a few more joiners on here. Okay. So what would you recommend for balcony planting? What, in the way of vegetables, these little finger carrots that I just held up, they do really well in containers. My brother-in-law grows these in containers and he always has two or three pots going. And what he does is he'll seed one, he'll wait two weeks and he'll seed his next pot. And as they germinate and start to produce, he will start the next pot and bring it forward and he starts Usually they take, what you're paying attention to on the package label is the number of days to maturity. And little finger has, and now I always have to check myself, so I have to put on my, my glasses to make sure I'm right. But the little finger is 55 to 60 days from seeding to maturity to producing small carrots. So as he said, he manages from the, about the 30th of April, he's eating fresh carrots usually around the 20th of May and he harvests, his crop is going on and he puts in three to four pots and he just keeps the reserve pots and he sort of stacks them like, it's very artistic what he does. For a guy when I, that when he first, I first married into his family, I didn't think he was ever going to garden but now he grows better tomatoes than I do. So. We all have our moments, but he grows on his little porch. He's growing carrots. He grows quite a salad garden. He grows peppers and tomatoes. And now that it's only he and his wife, he doesn't grow as many tomatoes because he used to be a fanatical tomato grower, but now he only grows two pots. He grows a cherry tomato and he grows a regular slicing tomato. He says this year he might grow a sauce tomato. He'd like to grow a sauce like something that he could turn into a paste and freeze because he really did enjoy his tomatoes and he was lucky because his season went a bit longer so he had that and he grows also the thing that fascinates me about him is he does grow patty pans he was the first person I met that grew the patty pan but there is a little zucchini and it actually comes in the Renee's seed line and it is, I don't have a picture of it, but it is called a pot zucchini. And they're about the size of the little cucumbers that you buy at the store. And he really likes them. He slices them up and they're delicious. He just puts them in a pasta. Well, actually I shouldn't say he does, his wife Lynn does, but he really enjoys those little pot zucchinis. And they're not as aggressive as the big zucchinis and they produce a nice manageable size zucchini but one of his favorites for his pots.
Well, this is a great way to spend a sunny afternoon, although I wouldn't know because our little space is in the basement at the Horticultural Society, and any of you who've been to classes know that the basement is pretty dark sometimes. However, we've made the best of it and turned it into what it is. I'm, I'm quite enjoying it, actually. I, I'm getting to talk about gardening. It's just fabulous, and I, I think that what we're doing is another way to change the subject or the narrative, if you will. I'm, I'm enjoying the fact that we are growing things. I'm getting excited about the fact that we're supposed to get warm weather, weather this weekend and we're going to start seeing warmer days and already the days are quite long. But the big temptation is because we're at home and we're looking for things to do, we're going outside. Be careful, don't go out and tromp around in your garden and flatten your soil and, and think that you gotta start cleaning up. We need to remember that we've still gotta protect some ladybugs that are hibernating. We wanna watch for the shoots that are coming up. And if we uncover it all too soon, we end up with things that get a little frostbite or they just disappear out of the population. So we do fight that battle a little bit. So don't get too carried away and don't go out and clean it all off. But if we get some warm weather and we're starting to see the snow really melt, as long as you don't tramp on your growing soil too heavily, I actually have always told people that I plant my sweet pea seeds on Good Friday. And I have already, last fall, I cleaned out the trench and cleaned it back and I've worked along the edge of the fence where I'm going to put them. And I'm going to plant my sweet pea seeds on Good Friday, although it never, it never fails. If I say I'm going to plant it on Good Friday, we either get heavy rain or we get snow, but I'm ready to go. And I am a sweet pea collector. In fact, on one of my visits to the UK, I got there in the fall, and that's actually when they sell all the new sweet pea seeds. I came home... I think, well, as the customs man said to me, because they stopped me, they said to me, you have an awful lot of P, uh, seed packets here. Um, are they for you or are you going to resell them? I said, no, they're all mine. I, you know, I felt a little possessive of them. I said, I don't resell sell them, I, they're mine. And because sweet pea seeds can live a long, quite a while in a package, as long as they don't get wet or they get frozen after they get wet, you can collect them. But I just wanted to say, as I have said to a few of my friends, do not let me go to the store and get sweet peas this year. This is just, this is from a trip two years ago and I still have quite a few left. So as a sweet pea addict, I have to say that I have a small habit. But right now I'm fighting the battle of which ones am I going to plant? Which ones should I save for next year? I don't think I'm going to save any. I think I'm going to do the entire 20-foot fence line because it's the sunniest spot in sweet peas. The sweet peas like cool soil to germinate in. And they like a long, deep root run. So I have, as I said, dug a trench. It's about four inches in depth. And I filled it with some nice manure. And I cleaned it up with some compost. And I've trenched it back and pulled all the soil I'm going to push back in there. But I'm going to bury my sweet peas in probably Good Friday or Easter or Sunday. Just depends on when I have time. And I'm going to use the inoculant. And it comes in a green package. It's available at all the garden centers. It's a rhizobium. And it actually helps the nitrogen go into the soil and develop strong plants. The only problem with planting them that early is that the birds think that you put that in just for them to eat the green shoots. So I'm always trying to protect them. So I have discovered that over the years... I tend to put my sweet pea netting in as I'm planting them so that I'm protecting them somewhat. And then I run along with bird netting in front of it, just lean it on it. And then the birds don't go into it and they get, they won't eat all the tops off. Although I have had them eat it off and I've gone, uh oh, I'm in trouble. But all it means is that instead of one stem, I get two stems because they're effectively pinching it back. 
And if we get really, really cold weather and we get a bit of snow, snow is a really good insulator. And all I will do is quite often run out with the leaf rake, that time, the spring time rake, and I'll just push the snow up onto them and it protects them and they'll just keep coming out because they like to have that deep root and they like it cool. So the deeper they run, the better they go. And then in about two weeks after Good Friday, I plant my peas. And there again too, plant them with the netting you want them to climb unless you're planting a bush pea and just start planting the cool soil and the cool vegetables because kale can be planted usually by the end of by the end of April and into the first week in May depends on how wet and slushy our garden is but if you can at all avoid it try to keep off the soil so you don't compact it because the plants get all tromped down and the soil gets too compacted and it's too heavy I'm enjoying my cup of tea. How's yours so far? It's dead air, so I better talk. Not that I've ever been at a loss for words. I'm just switching pages and trying to find some more things to talk about. I thought that there would be some questions. So I'm sitting here going, well, we could go on from here and say, I know that the garden centers have had to shorten their hours because of the situation, but I also know that they're there and I know that they have some staff still go working. And boy, some of the new spring things that I'm seeing coming in and have watched over the last little while and have seen that. And I mean, they do, you can keep your distance in a lot of them and the ones, the smaller garden centers, they have rules about how many can go in, but you can still go in and take a look. Or you could just go stand outside and stare wishfully at the garden center and will it to be as special as it becomes to us in the springtime. I'm, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I think that our garden centers are local businesses and just one of those things and that's probably the only comment I'm going to make about that I hope unless I get really carried away and start talking and trying to find more to talk about. I also have been working a little bit on trees and shrubs this last little while looking for some shrubs to plant it. I've got along the side of my driveway I have a big open space and this past winter was got a little harsh on the end of my driveway because the um a truck drove over the end of my planting so I've lost yet another juniper on the end of my driveway so I'm I'm looking for I have decided that I'm not going to go back to a juniper because not only that all the snow that I'm piling up on my junipers that's not helpful healthy for them on a lot of levels even though I try to push the snow over in under my pine and I push it over onto the perennials etc but when you pull the snow back, they're still nice and green. So I'm not that worried, except for the one that got run over. And he definitely got run over. So I have to find something for that corner. So I think I'm going to go to a deciduous shrubs so that at least you can see the branches sticking up out of the snow when you go to drive over it and you know who you are. You drove over my sh sh shrub, my juniper. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to play around with it a bit. We have a couple of questions. All right. So uh, Glenn's asking, can I cut any twigs and keep them in water to root them? Or should I use a rooting hormone and put them in the soil? I, at this time of year, I tend to stick them into potting mix and I use a rooting hormone and I prefer to get a rooting hormone like number three. If you notice the one that I used today was number two, the stem root. And then when you do take a cutting, you want to cut lost pruners, <laughs> found them. What you want to do is when you cut, you want to look where the branches were and where the branches were is where they're going to form. And I always cut at a broad angle and I use my pruners to try and not destroy them and I get a nice broad cut on them. And where the leaf joins the stem, and here again, it's where you're going to do a bit of rooting hormone. Although, you know, these willows, one of the big things that they do, 
Salix is an active ingredient or part of the active ingredient to make aspirin, but it also used to be part of our rooting hormones that we used to get. And my grandpa, when he planted a tree in a, or a bush in my in our house, he always had willow cuttings. So if you can see, I didn't dust the end of the cutting and you can see where the leaf node is and that's where the roots will form. And here again, don't break the stem. You just want to stick it in with a, a dibber and I put it into a soil so that it roots quite easily. And the trick with rooting some of these is to not let the soil dry out completely. And the other trick that you want to do is because you might get you might get a little bit of traffic and action going by what i will do is quite often i'll dip it in place and i will stick it in and then i will put a stick beside it and if these are small cuttings i will tie it or i will make sure that it's supported by the stick and here again bamboo sticks are nice and hard and they stay in place quite willingly so you're going to get it rooted that way and that should take it should take it about five to six weeks to root and then you find a place in your garden where you're going to create a nursery bed for these juvenile cuttings and you put them in a group and let them start and grow and leaf out naturally the other question we have here of course with all the sudden melt is should i put snow on my garlic patch or is it safe to let it go and see if it starts sprouting I would put snow on it because you don't want to emerge it, getting it emerging too fast. I had a text or an email this morning from my friend and he's telling me that his snow is melting in his vegetable garden and he's got chickweed already and it's lovely and green and fresh. So I'd put snow on it. Keep it, keep it covered. Thanks for the question, Natasha. Maybe that's what I should do is take cuttings off my shrub in the back and root it into the front. I might have to do that. I mean, in these days of trying to be frugal about what we're growing a little bit and what we're going to go and grow for petunias, etc. However, I can't resist the new petunias. Whatever you do, do not go to the new to the Proven Winners website and look at the new petunias. It's they're really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> There's a gorgeous cherry red one and I want it, but I have to be good. But that's famous last words. When you're doing your containers, Deb, what are you going to do? Well, <laughs> I have a whole stack of geraniums mm -hmm. that are overwintered. I have dusty millers that are overwintered. I started some snapdragons the other day, uh -huh. so hopefully, and I bought some alyssum seeds about a month ago because I went to the garden center for a particular seed and came out with a bunch of packages because I'm, well, I don't have these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then my problem with all these seeds, as you can see, is where am I going to plant half of this? I live in an average city size lot. My garden is 35 feet deep and 50 feet wide. Where I ever put all of this? And I'm already down to minimal lawn, which the dog doesn't like. So that becomes the issue. And when I started and I put in perennials and I put in shrubs, I was going to stop buying as many annuals. But now suddenly I have 40, 45 pots out and about. And I say, well, they're just covering the bald spots. Or they're just pretty out in front of the driveway. But they do give you that splash of color. And I have always agreed with several growers that I've talked to. Annuals are the show business of our garden. They're the rock stars. They come in there and they put on a big flowery show. And then we get our next season of flush of flowers. And so often when people go to the garden center in the springtime and they chat with people and they chat with the staff and they ask for recommendations, but they're looking at everything that's already in the garden center that's in flower, so with a perennial garden, for instance, you go in into the perennial lot and you buy perennials, but they're already in flower because that's the time of year when they flower. And then in July, they're suddenly standing there going, well, I have nothing that's flowering right now in my perennial garden. So if you haven't got that, 
what you might want to do is take that annual pot and put it where there's nothing flowering, but then make a note of it and go to the garden center and see what they have in that's flowering in July and August so that you can plan your garden step by step throughout and have flowering perennials right from the first, second week in April right into the end of September. It's so pretty to watch a garden evolve from just, you know, as you begin and then going from there. And it helps to bring in the pollinators so that your vegetable garden continues to produce these beautiful vegetables that we grow. And I like using, for instance, my favorite thing to put in are, is just a patch of sunflowers because they literally live up to their name. They stand tall and their heads move like radar. They follow the sun, but they also attract the pollinators and bring them down. For instance, if you planted those near your squash plants, the squash and the cucumbers would get pollinated. It's a great team. It's a really good team. Well, I'm enjoying talking gardening. I think this is great. Have another question. All right. Has anything come up in your garden yet? Has anything come up in my garden? Actually, I was wandering through the back part to try and see what was under the snow and noticed that my spinach is up under the snow, so I'm going to have fresh leafy greens sooner than I thought. However, I did look on the front flower beds where I have my early spring bulbs planted and I have just the tips of my dwarf iris are starting to show and my hepatica is turning green under the snow so I threw more snow on it because I really don't want it to flower until April when it's supposed to flower. So yes I do have a few things coming up in my garden and the leaf buds on some of the shrubs and the trees are big and fat so I think we're going to see some touches of green pretty quick here. Can you tell us about the violet? Oh, <laughs> you spotted my violet, did you? Well, this was, I went to Green Gate <laughs> and I had gone in very specifically and I was only going to buy bamboo canes to keep things supported. And then I, then they had the new plant shipment in. And I'm a sucker for violets. I've always, my grandma had, my grandpa had violets. My mom had violets. There was always a special table in our house for violets. And this one tickles me because it has this beautiful white frilly edge. And it's filled with blooms. And it's been sitting now in my kitchen for about six weeks. And I just love the, to, the ruffle flower and the beautiful purple tone to it. I, I can honestly say to you that half the crowding in my house is the fact that I have 10 African violets. I have 10, no, 11 holiday cacti. In fact, I would have brought my, one of my holiday cacti is flowering and it's white. It's beautiful. And I'm quite excited about it. And then I have nine orchids. So half the crowding in my kitchen isn't so much what's coming in from the garden. It's my hobbies and habits of buying other things that I like to look at. I, I love flowers. I just enjoy seeing them in my house. I think there's nothing fresher and nicer. And I haven't quite fallen in the trap of talking to all my plants or naming them like I saw on the news the other night. But I do have one or two that are favorites, so they do have names. Um, and one of my very, very first house plant that lived with me when I was at school, his na her name was Gloria, and Gloria lived with me for nine years. So to say that I've been doing this a long time is a long time, but Gloria and I lived together for nine years, and I finally, when I had to move one time, I gave her to a friend, and Gloria didn't like her, so Gloria didn't survive that move. <laughs> but I have a thing about house plants just as much as I do about what I have here, but African violets are so easy to look after. The trick is though, is to not overwater them and not to get water on the leaves. So I will, I water mine, not just because it's Sunday or Monday, I check them to make sure they've dried out completely, at least to the depth of my first knuckle. 
and then I give them a good drink and I never leave them standing in water. African violets can absorb about one half of 1% of their total root volume in water. So you don't want to overwater them. And I, I quite often, you will notice that mine's sitting in a little tin pot. I will take it out of the tin pot to water it. I will water it, I will set it in a saucer for about 15, 20 minutes, and then I take it out and put it back in its pretty pot. Because to me, they're so such a variety of color and pretty that I enjoy them that way. We have another question here. Sure. So, as you know, we had uh, one person at the very beginning. So yes. A lot of people coming in a little later. Uh -huh. Question about the grow light mm -hmm. and uh, any recommendations for grow lights for seedlings. That again came from Natasha. Okay, well, the thing about grow lights is that when you're looking at them, the spectrum should be large. And this particular one has a blue spectrum to it, which gives it good green, strong leafy leaves and is better for particularly growing vegetable seedlings or for growing seedlings from the start. And the only thing that I always tell people is that make sure that you've got adequate length to them. If they're only 20 inches long, then you're stuck with the size of the tray that you're going to use. And you're going to take the grow light and measure it out to see how it's going to fit over certain trays. And this particular one is the exact length of a grower tray. And that's what I like about it. And it is a good, a good uh, particular one. I, all the garden centers nowadays and, and some of the um, places that are selling uh, just seedlings or grow starts and, and hydroponics are selling grow lights now. I just like to know that they are, the spectrum is right, so I'm looking at that. And then I'm looking at how long and how hot they get. And a lot of them don't get hot now, so that makes a difference. And I, I can't emphasize enough, getting the fan, the air circulation and the light is the most important part of, of the whole grow up. So what about, I know your friend Janet likes to promote the chamomile tea. Yes. Have you ever used the chamomile tea as a as preventative a, to damping off? I have only heard about it in the last couple of years and I've not used it. However, it is, chamomile has always been one of those plants that we companion plant with things to build stronger root system. So it wouldn't, it would follow that it would probably be fine. But it is one of those questions that I get asked every once in a while. I, I find quite, I, it's just like um, chamomile also is a flavor enhancer around the base of fruit trees and a lot of the orchards are now planting the low growing chamomile around their fruit trees to enhance the flavor of the fruit and it is absorbed through the root so it is something that is used out there. Actually the first time I ever saw chamomile growing under trees etc was under the olive trees in Greece and they used it there. They said it increased the strength of the root system and it extremely, it was really particularly made the black olives flavorful. So one of those, one of those little bit of companion lore. I'm not seeing any uh, more questions okay. coming through. So I don't know if you want to maybe wrap up and well, I think we'll wrap this session because we'll be back on the 14th of April hopefully with no technical difficulties <laughs> but the horticultural society is really excited to be getting more into what we can do remotely so watch our website because we're going to do several online classes and we're going to try and do some just some videos so that we have some how-to videos going on and some of our classes are going to go remotely and we'll do them as webinars. We're going to do a grow your own food. We're going to repeat the one that I was doing. I'm going to finish the last two and then we're going to try again and we've got some design your yard programs coming up that will help you to plan out your yard. So watch for those and I've really enjoyed having tea with you and I've really enjoyed talking about gardening and don't forget 
look out for your sweet peas and start picking and choosing your varieties. And one of the things that I always do is when I'm at the sweet pea rack, I look for the knee high sweet pea, I look for the Royal Family sweet pea, and I look for the Spencer Giant. Because when you plant them on a fence, you'll get the short sweet peas, then the next size, and then the next size. The Royal Family are the heavy, heavily fragranced, and then there's all sorts of named varieties of sweet peas that I just enjoy. And the Spencer Giants have long stems, so they look wonderful in a vase. And there's nothing prettier at this time of year than pretty flowers in a vase and spring flowers, and then all summer and into the fall. So enjoy, and I hope this helps to inspire you to play on in your garden and play on with your garden plants. Thanks, and thanks for watching and putting up with us.